2020 has fundamentally changed the context in which South African municipalities govern and provide services. Future Cities Africa has partnered with South African Cities Network on a series of four episodes that look at how cities have fared during the pandemic and what fundamental lessons have been learned. We cover economic recovery, climate change, governance and municipal finance, and built environment. Diti Boho Makele is Program Manager for Sustainable Cities at South African Cities Network. Diti Boho, welcome. Give us a brief introduction to your role at South African Cities Network. So my work um, primarily focuses on supporting cities in their sustainability transition journeys. That means getting them to achieve the sustainability development goals that they've set for themselves, um, whether it's five-year um, goals through their IDP processes or longer-term goals through their growth and development strategies. For the past um, five-year period, um, we're in the last few months of the five-year period that we started in 2016, our focus has been on resource efficiency and sustainable infrastructure mainly looking at the themes of energy, water, waste, and climate change. Let's reflect on the State of Cities report of 2016. Since then, what has changed for the better and what has changed for the worse? We produce the State of Cities report um, every five years. Um, We've started producing it since 2004, and then from 2006, we started producing it every five years to coincide with the local government administrative and political cycle, you know, the change, what that happens when local government elections take place. So the last one we published in 2016, um, the key messages that came out there for the Sustainable Cities chapter was specifically around the fact that cities are still growing in a very resource intensive way with inefficiencies across sectors like energy, food, water, waste and transport. And that the continued silo approach to planning and service delivery is inefficient and not conducive to the cost cutting nature of sustainability. And the other key message was that cities are lagging quite behind with um, spatial transformation um, and they're continuing with the same sort of infrastructure and built environment developments that are pushing people to the periphery of cities and further and further away from economic hubs, thus increasing the social exclusion, uh, marginalization and inequality that we see in our cities. It also said that cities are still struggling with embedding sustainability into their day-to-day planning and service delivery provision. Yeah, so those are the key messages from the 2016 um, State of Cities report. Around climate action on the sustainable development goals, what is the current state of climate change interventions in South African cities? Since the 2016 report, there have been some um, progress that cities are making. The sustainable development goals are obviously a global commitment that we've made to the global community, the international community, and we're tracking them um, regularly. Every year, um, our cities need to report on, on their progress. So a lot of our cities are, have developed climate action plans which are in line with the Paris Agreement and in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. And so we see that happening um, a lot and the implementation of of those climate action plans is gradually taking root in our cities. There are areas where cities are doing amazing work and there are areas where they're still um, struggling along, but um, I think they will eventually get there. I don't think we'll achieve the SDG goals, like the global goals, ending poverty and having sustainable inclusive cities by 2030 in in South Africa per se, but we will have made some strides towards achieving those goals. And the implementation of that, I think, to just emphasize, does not only rely on cities, like the administrative part of cities. It relies on cities in the broader sense of the word, um, which includes the other sectors that are part of what makes up the city. So the private sector, civil society organizations, and us as ordinary citizens, we all have a role to play in that. So there's been a lot of progress that cities have made in the energy sectors. We see a shift um, towards more renewable energy systems 
for instance, now there's talk about how do we make um, electric vehicles accessible to, to our, our citizens or the infrastructure that enables people to have um, electric vehicles accessible. So um, you have electric charging stations around the city and the infrastructure that goes along with that. So there's been some progress that's been made in the energy sector um, and the climate change um, adaptation and mitigation um, areas. But when we look at water and waste, our cities are still lagging behind in, in, in those areas any specific other projects that you can mention so you've mentioned electric vehicles but is there any other specific climate adaptation or sustainability projects that is worth mentioning yes certainly um i'd like to make a special mention for the etiquini riverine um, management program which looks at cleaning up um, there are river systems. Um, we know that there's a lot of waste that ends up in our river systems and that ends up in, in, into the ocean subsequently. So what Etiquini is doing is doing a citywide riverine management program that incorporates different sectors within the city, um, bringing in the private sector, bringing in academia and the city to work together with communities that are impacted um, and that live and thrive along these these river systems. So that's an amazing example of um, climate change action that's taking place in, in our cities. And that project also brings in funding from international development agencies and our local funding agencies as well. Um, and it, it's, it's an amazing example of what multi-stakeholder collaboration and, and, and all of society collaboration means in terms of climate action in our cities. In the city of Tswane, for instance, they have a, a program around non, non-motorized transport, which encourages people to walk and cycle instead of getting into their cars. Um, we know that cars emit a lot of um, emissions in, into the atmosphere and pollute the environment. And so they have an initiative around non-motorized transport, which encourages people to walk and cycle and use less cars and get into public transport. They've got Ariane, which is their BRT bus service, which is also going to be expanded um, in, in, in future. As, as these programs and, and initiatives take root and they get more support from the city itself uh, across the departments and also um, in, in the private sector, civil society and citizens in general. The city of Joburg is also about to put out its climate action plan, which also, and, and they've recently um, completed the environmental sustainability strategy and action plan. And both of these bring together different actors within the urban, so private sector, civil society organizations, and they are really pushing for this collaboration to happen because we understand um, as organizations that support cities that it's not only the city's role to ensure that um, climate action does take place but that the whole of society which is espoused by the integrated urban development framework it, that it actually happens that this all of society approach to our development and getting where we need to get to by 2030 happens. So the city of Cape Town has um, initiated a climate resilience strategy and they have a chief resilience officer in place. And resilience is normally something that we don't really think about when we think about um, sustainability and inclusion and social equity. But it's a real issue if you look at it in a broader sense that we need to be ready for any stress or any shock that might hit our cities. So they have put that in place and they're doing a lot of work around their water management. We all know that um, they went through a, a quite a rough time around 2018 with their drought management activities, but they're really, they've really pulled out of that and they're really putting in a lot of effort and a lot of strategies around water management to make them more water resilient. What is the one biggest challenge to climate change adaptation? I think it's funding, um, finances. So climate financing is, is a challenge because it's not the normal 
budgeting and financing allocation that you would find in cities. So cities don't have a budget for climate adaptation. They have financing for sectoral programs. So you have a budget for human settlements, you have a budget for transport, you have a budget, etc., cetera, for, for these different functions in cities. But one that specifically is for climate adaptation is, is, is a challenge. And a lot of the time, cities have to reprioritize their budgets and look at their discretionary um, funds and see where they can allocate those for climate adaptation. So I think access to finance is, is a real challenge. Like I said, many of our cities have climate action plans in place. The challenge is the financial aspects attached to the adaptation actions. So if they can get assistance with funding from different sources, and that's international, regional, and, and local, um, and there are a number of funding streams that can be tapped into. The other challenge with that added to the financing is that cities need assistance with project packaging to make their projects bankable, to make um, funding the, the funding schemes open. So those skills are not uh, necessarily inherent in cities. Some cities need to bring those in and that costs money as well. Um, but some cities do have some capacity around project packaging, but a lot of them still need assistance in, in project packaging and ensuring that they get um, bankable projects out for funders to, to assist. Uh, who needs to take the lead in climate action and how? And if we don't act now, what are the consequences over the next decade? Some cities are already taking the lead um, with the climate action plans, but the implementation of these plans, like I mentioned, requires multi-stakeholder willingness and effort and coordinated collaboration across all spheres of government. The private sector can certainly take the lead in the investment and pooling of available resources and assist cities in implementing these climate action plans. Civil society can take the lead in the areas that they're very good at, at mobilizing communities, raising awareness, and making sure that people know their rights and know what they can contribute um, as well to climate action efforts. It's, it's a whole of society effort. Other certain actors take the lead in areas that they are competent in and they're able to take the lead on, and other actors do the same. And if we all pull together, I think we will have improved our chances of achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. If we don't do anything, if we're all waiting for somebody to take action, to take the lead, unfortunately, we're going to suffer the consequences. We are seeing more and more adverse climate change impacts through floods and extreme weather events that we're experiencing. Um, prolonged drought periods, then after that we'll have floods, that erodes the arable land and soils and that affects food security. We're seeing how our unsustainable um, consumption of water is affecting even more and more cities around the country. So if we don't do anything about that and wait for somebody to take the lead, I, and unfortunately, I think we're, we're really going to feel the effects in, in the next decade. For private sector to be more involved, are there any policy limitations currently inhibiting action? Some regulatory instruments within cities and within government in general have perhaps barriers to entry for the private sector. So for instance, a city cannot just choose a private sector company to come and help them with their water management. There needs to be a procurement um, process that's followed. And sometimes the procurement regulations only allow for the least cost um, proposal. And that's not um, always the best option for cities. And so those are some of the things that sometimes inhibit private sector involvement. So if uh, procurement regulations in, in, in cities and in, in, in government in general can be adjusted to accommodate some of these interventions that really need to, to take place, I think that will go a long way in encouraging the private sector to, to get involved. How are cities addressing urban food security and what more can be done? 
Urban food security programs um, exist in different forms in, in cities. Some sit in um, the social development units in cities, some ex exist in the economic development, some exist in the environmental units. And these range from enabling um, cooperatives and civil society organizations that deal with urban food security to get support from, from cities, whether it's in the form of municipal land where they can start urban gardens, or whether it's in the form of um, allowing them to use rooftops, etc. So it's taken different forms, and it's a, more of a citizen-driven approach, which is excellent because that's what you want. You, As a city, sometimes you need to take a, a back seat and allow communities and citizens to take initiatives. And then you as a city are there to, to provide the support and maybe some funding assistance to enable these, these programs to take place. There are some, for instance, in, in, in other cities where the city heavily funds um, initiatives like urban food gardens and ensuring that People have access to areas and, and, and outlets where they can have food, but it's really a civil society and community-led area. Uh, and, and how can cities rapidly respond to sustaining and improving water and sanitation services in informal settlements? It's, it's a fairly complex matter. Sustainable provision of services in informal settlements. Informal settlements are... Um, a complex matter in the country because some are on private land, others are in ecologically sensitive areas, others are where development was not going to take place in cities. So it's a real challenge for cities to um, say we're going to provide sustainable a provision of services. They can certainly provide um, temporary um, and short term, but that also costs them a lot of money. But it's really a complex matter, especially under the, um, the pandemic conditions where you need to make sure that people have access to water and sanitation services. So that also is something that should involve assistance from national government and civil society. And we've seen a lot of civil society organizations stepping on board and coming to the party really um, during these emergency times and assisting communities. Um, and cities are also doing a lot and we need to really commend them for being able to mobilize funds, um, reprioritize budgets to address the challenges that we face in, in informal settlements. And this is on top of the already existing backlogs of informal settlement upgrading and ensuring that people have access to, to decent homes. So it's a really complex uh, matter that just doesn't have a one solution um, option to it. What are the financial impacts of the pandemic on water and sanitation services? The financial impacts have been quite significant um, due to the emergency nature of the pandemic and the services that had to be brought into communities at rapid speed and as efficiently as possible. There are some estimates just for this financial year of about 14 billion rand in losses for cities because they've had to use funds that they hadn't intended to use for emergency services. They've had to request funds from national government departments to enable them to, to, to provide these services. And they've also have had to redirect funds um, and reprioritize their budgets to accommodate um, the emergency services. And then added to this is the fact that their own revenue streams have been steadily going down because of the economic impacts of the pandemic on household incomes. So people who normally would pay their water and electricity rates are, are not able to do that anymore. And that affects um, municipal revenue. And municipalities often use those funds to then support communities that cannot afford those services or to pay for those services. So it's, a, it's been a really quite significant impact and the real impact will only be felt post the pandemic um, when we take stock of, of how much was spent and how much revenue was lost in, in this period.
With regards to the circular economy in South Africa, what's the current status and what are some of the key interventions? The circular economy is a real interesting opportunity for, for cities to, to get involved in. I'll just touch on the waste um, sector, for instance. Um, there are so many opportunities and cities are already looking at, at how to incorporate secular economy principles in their waste uh, management um, practices and in the waste value chain. We've seen the increase in the informal waste pickers or waste reclaimers in, 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 in our cities. And a lot of cities are seeing the opportunity of involving um, these waste, waste reclaimers in the waste value chain because they play a significant role in diverting waste to landfill. And cities are already also looking at opportunities to use some of the unrecyclable waste to generate energy that can be used in sectors that are energy intensive, etc. So it's starting to take shape. Um, the plastics sector is also doing um, a lot of work around the secular economy um, strategies. So the waste sector for me is one of the low hanging fruits, to use that phrase, for cities to, to get the secular economy started. I'm thinking of another question with regards to the mayor of Paris uh, mentioning project for them being a 15-minute city where you can get everything that you need within 15 minutes. How doable is that for South African cities over the short and medium term? The 15-minute city concept is quite an amazing and innovative approach to urban planning in developed countries. I think it, it works well in, 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 in the European context. In our context, because of the um, inherited spatial form that we have, where you have um, economic hubs, and then you have suburbs, and then you have townships right at the periphery of, of cities. Just coming into, for instance, a city like Joburg, if you live in Orange Farm takes you, what, 40 minutes or 30 minutes at the most if you're in a very fast taxi. So that concept for South Africa would really take a lot of, if we really work on our spatial transformation um, challenges that we have, and bringing people closer to economic hubs, bringing people closer to the services that they need, and reducing our urban sprawl, and making sure that the services and the amenities that people need access to are available within that 15-minute um, radius. So it's, it's, it's quite a challenge for us, and I don't think it's something that we can achieve in, in, in the short term. Um, but hopefully in, I don't know, 20, 30 years' time, we'll have been able to, to, to make our cities more compact and more sustainable. What are the main lessons taken from 2020, and how can we address them to not only survive, but to thrive in the future? So I think the main lessons that we've taken out of 2020 is that when hit with a crisis, we can work together. We can collaborate, we can pull our funds together and resources, and we can act. And I think that's a great lesson to learn for the climate emergency that we have, that we really need to treat it as a real emergency. And that can take us in, in good stead for the next decade to come. So collaboration, pooling resources together and different actors and different sectors taking the lead in the areas where they are competent in um, can take us forward um, and help us survive and thrive into, into the new year and into the decades to come to, to 2030. The other lesson, I think, is about resilience and how important it is for us to plan for resilient cities um, and make sure that um, urban resilience it goes beyond just the environmental agenda. We need to look at the social aspects. Um, the pandemic has showed us how important um, health and well-being are, not just physical getting ill, but our mental health as well, and our access to social and recreative amenities. Um, people have seen how nature is important, and they have 
a, a better appreciation of the value of nature and having nature accessible in cities. I think those are, for me, the, the, the key lessons, working together and understanding what urban resilience really means.